Welcome to Pastor's Class. This Pastor's Class, for the next uh, little bit, few weeks, we're going to be going through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and, and open it up to Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is where you find the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to just take a few uh, weeks going through it. We pulled it out of uh, the Gospel of Matthew because it really does kind of stand alone of discourses that Jesus gave. So when you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, there you find the Sermon on the Mount, and it's easy to uh, not understand it completely. So what we'd like to do is uh, just sort of give some context and then read the Sermon on the Mount and then just sort of go through uh, what that means for us as Christians because it is a distinctly uh, Christian discourse, a, a distinctly Christian sermon. So let's do what we always do. Uh, let's begin by praying, and then we'll just sort of jump right in. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the chance to pause and study. We pray that you would reveal yourself to us in your word. Help us that we might be more like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's take this Sermon on the Mount and uh, put it in its context. Today, we're going to just study... The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes really are sort of the front door uh, to the Sermon on the Mount, but we don't want to uh, look at them without understanding what's happening in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bible, you can flip back a few pages. Matthew chapter 1, there you find the genealogy. Uh, you find all the lists of Jesus from a very Jewish standpoint. And then in chapter 1, you see the birth of Jesus. The narrative that Matthew gives us is the birth of Jesus. And then by the time you get to Matthew chapter 2, there you have the Magi, uh, we call them the wise men, and uh, Herod shows up. And there's something very tragic in Matthew chapter 2 that we oftentimes skip over. It happened in Bethlehem. It's the, the killing of all the uh, toddlers, male toddlers in the city of Bethlehem. It's a tragic event in uh, Matthew chapter 2. And uh, then the writer brings us out of that Jesus uh, has been taken down to Egypt. They come back, and they're living in Nazareth. You get to Matthew chapter 3, and uh, Matthew puts a pause there and introduces John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus, and he is the one preaching, making a way for Jesus. He says that there's one coming after him that's greater than him. John the Baptist in Matthew 3 will uh, baptize Jesus for uh, the righteousness. Jesus says we, we do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then when, when you get to chapter 4 of Matthew, Matthew gives us the account of Jesus going into the wilderness, fasting, going into the wilderness, and there being tempted by Satan. It's a fascinating read. Go and read it sometime. Uh, that's where the writer of Hebrews talks about how Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So Matthew 4 is where that happened. At the end of the fasting and the temptation by Satan, in Matthew chapter 4, the, uh, the angels come and minister to him, to Jesus. And after that, he's gone through every bit of that, now his public ministry begins. And at the end of chapter 4, you have him gathering up steam. He's getting his disciples, starting to preach and teach. He's having this notoriety. People are being healed. And now crowds are gathering around him. And that's where Matthew 5 shows up. What's known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's not called that in the Bible. I think Augustine's the first one to call it that. I've been to the place that is the uh, Mount of Beatitudes where uh, they, they speculate. The thing about going to Israel is that you don't know exactly uh, where Jesus was in that land. Oftentimes they have to speculate. You see lots of uh, crusading castles and things like that. Churches there were built by the crusaders. But on the uh, Mount of Beatitudes, uh, there it's a sloping hill and uh, going down to the sea. And there you would have Jesus, uh, the, the text says that, uh, that, that the crowds came to him and probably surrounded by first the, the 12 disciples and then other people because he has, has gotten such notoriety, such popularity for the great things he does, for the radical teaching. 
And uh, that's where uh, the Beatitudes come into play. So what I'd like to do, let's read uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through uh, 13, or, excuse me, through 1 through 12. That's where you find the Beatitudes. And they need to be taken as a unit. A lot of times a preacher will go through and preach a sermon on each beatitude. I've done that myself. I look back on some sermons I preach. They're terrible if you have that. Uh, do away with that. I, I really think it's better. I think it's better for you to take the beatitudes as a unit. Because when you read them, uh, verse 3 sounds a lot like verse 10. It serves as a, an inclusio. Uh, so let's just read them and sort of get a picture of it. Matthew chapter 5. This is what the Bible says. Seeing the crowds, remember they, they now have gathered around him, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. When, his, when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, and this is what he said. So here come the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So there are the Beatitudes. Let's sort of get a handle on why are they called the Beatitudes. Uh, the word Beatitude, um, it comes from a Latin word, beatus, which means... Uh, happy, um, blessed, which really comes from the Greek word makrios, which means to, uh, to have joy, to rejoice in. And if you're following along in uh, the Christ-centered uh, commentary, by the way, that is a really good commentary set. Christ-centered exposition, you should pick that up for all that we have. Uh, the whole New Testament, we have for Psalms. Um, this one is, is the Sermon on the Mount. It really is helpful. And I'll be using that as the guide uh, over the next few weeks. But in the uh, Christ-centered um, exposition, Danny Aiken is the writer for that one, and, and he's done a good job of, of bringing forward the idea with the word delight. So that's really why we've used that in our outline today. So here's what Jesus does. He says, here are the things that you ought to delight in. Now, before I jump into the Beatitudes, I want to point out these are not just ways for you to become a Christian. They're not even that at all. They actually are just the reverse. There you have a stair step. You have a, what Harry Reader would call a stair step of Christianity, and that bottom step is where you have to start. But that bottom step is very similar to the very last step found in verse 10. But before I get started, just take a look at those two verses. So verse 3 says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then drop down to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you have those two verses that are serving as bookends. It's called an inclusio. And they are, those two verses give you the entire theme for the Beatitudes. And what you have there is an entrance into the kingdom of heaven, poor in spirit, and then the great example, the final, uh, final example of being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven is that you are persecuted. So let's use them like stair stepper. Let, let's, let's climb up the step and see what happens to us when we take um, the Beatitudes as a means, as an indicator of being a Christian. Here's the first one. Number one, delight in your spiritual bankruptcy apart from from God's grace. So we've gone right into verse 1. Jesus uh, went up on the mountain, sat down, the crowds came to Him, and opened His mouth and began to teach them. Verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that means, here's, this is an important front door. 
in order for you to be a member of the kingdom of heaven, you have to be someone who has come to the point in your life where you are poor in spirit. You might say it another way. That there is no real understanding of the grace of God found in Jesus if you don't have a good concept of what it means to be a sinner, what it means to be a, a, a beggar. I think it, this has to be uh, for personal conversion. This is where I think the modern uh, church has gotten swept up into a little bit of the therapeutic movement that that Jesus will help you with your problems, that Jesus will walk you through uh, your down times. All of those things are true, but we, we don't need to exclude the fact that why Christ came is that we are, we are sinners, separated from God, and need conversion. And the first step of conversion is to understand that, to see yourself as a sinner, even even Martin Luther, when he died, that, that was his, his final statement, that we are, we, are, we are beggars. It's good for us to understand where we stand before God because what that does is it puts in stark relief the wonderful grace of God. So the fuller your understanding of, of sin will, will, will give you a greater understanding of God's grace. And the more you understand grace, the actual more gracious you are to other people. This has to happen uh, personally. I think we need to understand corporately as a church that we are a gathered group of saints that are redeemed by Christ. We were sinners with sinful natures. It helps me extend patience to people. It should help you to extend patience to me. Uh, it's good to, to remember that universally, that mankind, man and woman, everyone that's ever been born after Adam and Eve entered into this world with a sinful nature and uh, are spiritually bankrupt. It's funny that word poor that is used here that Jesus uses. There are lots of words in Greek that you can use for poor. Many of them will uh, talk about a socioeconomic level. Uh, the poor in spirit here, this word is a real strong, um, uh, destitute, uh, spiritually without a clear understanding this is who I am. One of the things that we must do to, to make sure that the gospel is crystal clear, we've got to always keep pointing people to the fact Jesus came to save sinners, which is a wonderful thing. And as the church that believes the Bible, that points people to the gospel, it's good for us to, to say that, that Jesus came to save sinners. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When you realize that, what happens is the kingdom of heaven opens up because you realize you can't do it on your own. It's a, complete, uh, it's a complete rejection of pride and an embracing of the grace of God. The first step, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's take another step in. I think these first two Beatitudes really speak to conversion. And the second one uh, speaks as well. You have poor in spirit, but look at the grief. I'll give you a, a second point, it's right here. Delight in your deep, grief over sin because God will comfort you. The beautiful, the beautiful truth of the gospel is that a confession of sin doesn't lead to condemnation. It leads to God's comfort. Let me just read it to you. It's verse 4. <clears throat> Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, lots of the Beatitudes are pulled out of the context and used for all kinds of things. This is one of those that that you might use at a funeral, you might use to, um, to comfort a friend that is really hurting. And, but really, that's not, I mean, those things are true, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. You're finding here this, this, this tightly wound argument that says there should be spiritual bankruptcy, let's start with the poor in spirit, and uh, those who mourn, mourning over, over our own sin. I think in my mind I would go to a place like um, like Isaiah chapter 6. So Isaiah is in the temple, and you remember uh, what he sees? Uh, he sees the enthronement of God, and his response is, Woe is me, I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips, I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord, I should not have seen this. It's a real... Um, 
It's a real hatred of sin. It's good for us to remember to hate sin. This, this is the very opposite of being sorry because you were caught. This is the very opposite of being sorry that your sin put you in a bad spot and you're sorry that you're going to be punished for it. This is actually being grieved at an offense. This is, this is you being sorry that you made such a mistake that you have hurt someone. This is what we might call um, conviction. <clears throat> it's, a good, it's a good thing to remember in the Christian church that in order for people to be converted, they first must be convicted of their sin. It, it's, uh, it's good for us to remember that guilt has a purpose. Guilt is useful in the economy of God when it comes to the gospel. That we, uh, we should feel guilty for sin. In fact, what Jesus is saying here is there's a certain level of, of delight. Blessed are those who mourn, who, who realize that there's this terrible thing that I've done wrong, I don't deserve the goodness of God, but Jesus, who's going to go to the cross, I mean, this is a precursor to the cross, Jesus is going to go to the cross and take the punishment, and once you are convicted of sin, you don't stay there. Uh, guilt has a purpose. Guilt is a vehicle. It's not a destination. Guilt is a vehicle. It's, it's not where you're going. Guilt is there to get you somewhere. It's there to get you to the point of an understanding not only of hating sin, being sorry for sin, being sorry for the, for the offense to God. And that brings you to a point of seeing the cross. I, that's why I think these first two Beatitudes uh, speak to conversion, opening up to the kingdom of God and a real comforting. There is no comfort like the comfort of, of forgiveness that God gives us in Christ. There's no cleansing, and we'll talk about pure in heart in a moment. There's no cleansing like that which comes from, from knowing Christ. And here on the very front end of Jesus' ministry, on the very front porch of the Sermon on the Mount, He gives us these stairs that we come up. We see the first two having to do with conversion. Now, once conversion happens, we get to the third one. Let me point it out to you. <clears throat> this is what the text says in verse 5. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Or we'll read it here. We should delight in our dependence and your submission to God, and then He will reward you. Meekness. <clears throat> meek gets a, bad, uh, gets a bad rap. The word meekness does. You, you've heard people say uh, meekness is not weakness, and that's, that's true. But what we have here in verse 5, when you see the word meek, think of the word uh, humble. Think of the two people in the Bible that are said to be so humble. One is Moses in the Old Testament. The other is Jesus in the New Testament. And the, the misuse of the word humble. There's something that happens post-conversion. <clears throat> There's something that happens in, in the first two Beatitudes that is this idea of mourning and this idea of spiritual bankruptcy, uh, this being poor in spirit, when that happens, grace comes in, there's a change. This beatitude is, is evidence of a change. Humility is evidence of a change. I, I uh, have a men's discipleship group, and we just got finished with uh, Andrew Murray's book on humility. It's great. It's really more of a pamphlet than it is anything else. <clears throat> and he just, for 90 pages just had us look deep into what it means to be humble, what it means to, to rejoice when someone else is succeeding in the same field that maybe you didn't succeed in. Humility becomes this, this evidence. Meekness becomes an evidence of God's working in your life. And, and humility is one of those things that we pray for that is not natural. Uh, we know that pride, uh, God is opposed to the proud, and so... So meekness and humility is something that is born in us and that must be nurtured and will grow. And Jesus says that, that the person that is meek, the person that is submitting to God, the person that is putting others before themselves, according to verse 5, 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This feels like this eschatological, uh, this idea of, of heaven and then the new heavens and the new earth. This is still talking about evidences of salvation. So one of the things we got to sort of kind of be remember, uh, be reminded of is that this is not you acting in such a way to gain salvation. This is you experiencing grace and then evidences of salvation. So we delight in your dependence on and in your submission to God, and He will reward you. Let's move on to the fourth, the fourth one. Number four says to delight in your longing for God and see God satisfy you in Him. So that, that beatitude is in verse 6. Let me show it to you. Blessed are those, see the appetites? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So as you understand, the first two are conversion. The second are now evidences, the internal evidences. One is humility. And here in verse 6, there's a changed desire. One of the evidences of you being a Christian is the fact that you actually desire Christian things, that you, that you want to please God, that you desire to be at worship, that you desire more of God's Word. Um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the things that should be an indicator uh, that you're not a believer is that you don't love the things of God. I've, I've said it before, and I think it to be true, that if you... If you don't want to be with God's people, you don't like to sing the songs of the Lord, you don't like to pray, you don't like to read the Bible, uh, there may be some indicators there that you don't know Christ. Jesus says here that, that those that hunger and thirst, these natural, these natural appetites, hunger and thirsting for righteousness, uh, Jesus says that's an indication of the kingdom. Verse 6, they'll be satisfied. Now, we might call this, sanctification. So the first two are conversion, and then the third beatitude is evidence. Then what we're moving now into, we're going up the stairs, is sanctification. This idea of you changing on the inside, your wants changing. Now, admittedly, righteousness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for the righteousness of Christ, for honoring God, to living a pure life, those are acquired tastes. If you've been converted and you came out of a fairly sinful life, uh, those, those tastes are there. Uh, they're acquired and they will grow. Jesus says it like this, and you can help with that. I think this is where spiritual disciplines come into play. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek first, this is a good commentary on this beatitude, Seek first the kingdom of God, and these things will be added unto you. Delight, your, delight in your longing for God, and see yourself satisfied in Him. One of the great protections for your soul is going to be the fact that you actually are genuinely satisfied in Christ. You're not looking for other trash out there to, to feel it. This, this beatitude is very helpful. Uh, I think for this is helpful for singles. This is helpful for married people that are not putting pressure on their spouse to be the person that, that satisfies all their needs, that we find our satisfaction in Christ. Let me move to the fifth one. Number five, delight in graciously helping others, knowing that God will graciously help you. It's the, it's the great word mercy. Do you see number seven? <clears throat> Blessed are the merciful. Happy are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Here are those that have been changed by the grace of God in Jesus, and, and your response, this is how you can really gauge what the Lord is doing in your life. Your response to other people, you, you are, it's a loving response prompted by the need of someone and then your desire to help. Uh, it, it really is found in forgiveness, forgiving people. It's good for us to remember uh, how sinful we were before God saved us, what it took for God to save us. We will never actually have to forgive other people more than God forgave us. So it's good. For, that's why you hear uh, talk about the cross on each Sunday, talk about 
the crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus, the grace of God there, because that's our center point. That's where we operate from. And it, we can't ever forget that because that gives us a ground to stand on to actually forgive other people, to help other people, to extend love to other people that are not lovable. So you understand how, how here you see the sanctifying now. So now, now what's happened on the inside, hunger and thirsting for righteousness, now is starting to turn outward. So you have a conversion. It's changed your appetites. Now it's changing your attitude to other people. Let's keep moving quickly. Then we'll come to the sixth one, number six. Delight in a clean and pure heart, for you will enjoy eternal fellowship with God. Verse 8, I'll read the Beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is, this is a love for worship. This is um, someone that has been changed. This is uh, after a life of growing in Christ. This is the idea uh, that, that you love the thought of going to heaven. <clears throat> it's not preached enough. I, I haven't preached on it enough. Uh, I need to do that more, especially with what we're facing in the world and the United States, uh, to keep our eyes on heaven. It's good for us to be reminded this is not our home. This is, this is not where we're going to spend eternity that the things we go through are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Uh, this, is, this is what makes us Christian. Tomorrow I'll preach a funeral for a wonderful woman that lived a godly life, that loved Jesus and loved her family, and has gone on to be with the Lord, and has such a great reward. And she was ready, desiring, to see the Lord. One of the great... Um, comforts in pain and in death is this assurance that we uh, receive a reward, that it is God Himself. And, and as your heart is made more and more pure, you will more and more desire that. You will loosen your grip on the things of the earth and look forward to seeing the Lord. Let's keep moving. All right, number five, number six. Let me take it to number seven. <clears throat> Number seven, I have the same outline that you have. Delight in being a peacemaker because it gives evidence that you are a child of the God of peace. I think this one, verse nine, is probably misused more than any other beatitude. Let me read it to you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So people pull it out of there and uh, will say, okay, if uh, you want to be called a son, son of God, son or daughter of God, then you have to be a person that makes peace. And so we should all get along. We should press for unity in all things. And I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I do think he's saying that uh, being a peacemaker is a mark of being a Christian. Remember now it's outward. Started low, conversion, the first two. There's an internal change. Something happens. Now it goes external to mercy. Now our longings have changed. Our desires have changed are looking toward heaven, and here is how it's practically worked out. Peacemaking. When I say peacemaking, this is not a pathway to become a Christian. I think Jesus has in mind peace with God, peace with others. I think to be a peacemaker, it means you find a way to articulate the gospel in such a way that people understand it, and the Spirit of God can use that to bring conversion. I think that peacemaking means you're a person whose primary desire is to see people have peace with God with the understanding that that peace is found only in Christ. Now, having said that, I do think there is an obligation, especially among brothers and sisters in Christ, to not be someone that causes dissension, but to be someone that brings the body together, that, that focuses on Jesus. So a peacemaker is someone that is first about the gospel and, and then taking the gospel and putting it into the life of the church. I think there's probably a third application. Uh, you know, we just got out of the book of Romans and uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 18, Paul says that as, as much as it is possible with you, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That, that means that we, we seek to be people 
that are not contentious. We certainly will stand up for the things we believe in. We certainly will not uh, bend on the gospel and on our, our convictions. We have to be people of conviction. But, but our approach is to point people to the great peacemaker. So we're almost to the top of the chain. One more beatitude. Number eight, <clears throat> delight in the inevitable persecution because you will receive a great reward. Look at verses 10, 11, and 12. There's a beatitude in verse 10 and then the application in verse 11 and 12. Let me give it to you. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So remember the first beatitude, blessed are those, those who mourn, kingdom of heaven. Now, your faith has developed to such a degree, you now are, 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 have come up the stairs to, and you are growing, living for Christ. It's evident in how you live. You're seeking to be a peacemaker. But the truth of the matter is, because of your convictions, persecution comes. And Jesus says, you, you should be happy that your life has, has given such evidence that the people around you hate it. Blessed are those who are persecuted, but notice it's for righteousness' sake. And then the application. I'm going to close with these two things. Verse 11 and 12. Notice the turn Jesus makes in verse 11 and 12. So he's given this discourse from verse 3 to verse 10. Here comes the application. See the you? <clears throat> Blessed are you when others revile you, that's to say terrible things, to persecute you, and then utter all kinds of evil against you on my account. In other words, because you're a Christian. Pers persecution is no good if it happens just because you're a jerk. I mean, that, that's not persecution. That's retribution. <laughs> persecution should be because there's such evidence that you are Christian. I think this is coming for, for us. In fact, Jesus, he evidently is telling us this. Verse 12, he says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Okay, keep your eyes on heaven, and then you're in good company. For they also persecuted the prophets who were before you. The personal uh, application here for Christians. Let's speak Christians in the United States of America. It's 2021. We're in the midst of unbelievable political upheaval, cultural upheaval, the likes of which uh, I have never seen. Most people that are, that are watching now have never seen. Most people in our church, we've never experienced this in the United States. You think back, uh, the United States founding, you go back to the 1900s, 1800s, 1700s, 1600s. The United States really began because of Christian persecution Protestant persecution in England. So you reach back there. Uh, there's been turmoil in, in Christianity from the 1600s to the 1500s. The Protestant Reformation begins. We come out of darkness. You reach all the way back to the very beginning of Christianity. Ours has always been a, a religion that is persecuted, whether it's in the West or in the East. I mean, at least we haven't even talked about how right now there are so many millions of Christians living under terrible conditions. All of that to say is we've lived for some time in the United States in a little bit of a bubble. And that bubble is beginning to burst. And it's going to be up to you and I to take these things we believe and hold dear, to live them in such a way and to accept some of the terrible things that are coming our way because of what we believe, not just about Jesus, but what we believe about gender, what we believe about sexuality, what we stand for. I don't think that it'll, I don't think persecution will come in the form of uh, physical persecution. I don't, I don't think we'll see that. I think it's job discrimination. I think uh, you won't be able to get an education. You won't get the promotion. I think it will probably happen financially. I, I really don't know how it will happen. I do know that Jesus has said on the front end, here's an evidence of the fact that you are mine, you belong to me. And he said it twice here that you're, that you're blessed 
and you should rejoice because the reward you seek is in heaven and you, there's a long history. They did the same thing to the prophets before you. A long history of the people of God finding joy in the things of God even as they struggled here on earth. So, <clears throat> the Beatitudes. It's a good front door for us to get into the Sermon on the Mount. I look forward to the weeks ahead as we listen to the teachings of the one we worship, Jesus himself. If you join me as we pray, and we'll conclude. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Beatitudes. Strengthen your church. Strengthen the men and women at Hickory Grove. Lord, make us people that love Christ, that long for heaven, and are willing to live our convictions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.